we're going to read chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, and then pray together. The word of God reads as follows. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all the living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was on the earth. So Noah with his sons, his wife and his son's wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts, of beasts that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. God, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for just ministering to us. And Lord, as we go through this incredible story, one that uh, so many people know and have heard of, Lord, believer or not, uh, Lord, we pray this morning that you will just speak to us. Maybe clear up any misconceptions that we have about Noah and what you did in and through him, about the event of the flood, um, and Lord, especially about your judgment and about your grace. So as we consider these things this morning, would you minister to us, God, and speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Genesis chapter 7. So what we've seen in Genesis chapter 6 is God giving the direction to Noah that he should build the ark and that God had had enough of the wicked, sinful humanity. And we know that within the span of from the time of Adam and Eve uh, and their fall when sin entered the world until the time of Noah, which we understand to be somewhere close to 1,500 years when you add up all of the uh, people and their lifespans, that uh, by that point in time, God had already reached a point where he said, uh, my spirit will no longer strive with man. And so this is a very sad thing that God has reached a point with, with humanity that he said, I have to do something. I have to judge mankind because of where we had ended up. And so God had, of course, commanded Noah to build the ark, and he began to do that, and that's what we studied last week. And as Noah was building that ark, God had, you know, of course, given him uh, divine plans. He had told him what materials to use. And we know, as we looked at uh, the progression of Noah's life, that he was about 500 years old when he had his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that it was about that time that he began to build the ark and that he built the ark for about 100 years. And when he was 600 years old, as we will come to today, the flood waters began to come on the earth. So over the course of that 100-year period of time, Peter tells us that uh, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We're also told that Noah was a person who walked with God in a very similar way that his predecessor Enoch did. And so God uh, looked upon Noah with favor, and we looked at last week that Noah was actively seeking the grace of God in his life in the midst of that crooked and that perverse generation. And one of the things as we get into our study today that I want to remind us of as Noah was building the ark and that God had given him directions. Remember, uh, Noah couldn't go down to the lumber store 
right? He had to do everything from scratch. Uh, let me share this with you. Let the reader reflect on the multitude of trees that had to be felled, on the great labor of conveying them, and the difficulty of joining them together. The matter was also long deferred, for the holy man was required to be engaged more than a hundred years in the most difficult labor. So he had to do everything. He had to cut the trees down. He had to skin the bark. He had to cut it up into uh, some kind of planks or beams. He had to do all of that at a raw material preparation level before he could ever get to the place of building the ark. Now, I don't know about you, but um, when I have difficulty completing a task, when I have challenges, sadly, I usually resort to grumbling and complaining. Can anyone relate to that? Any kids here today who uh, joyfully say to their parents when they ask them to do chores, oh, absolutely, praise the Lord, mom and dad, I'm, I'm on it. Uh, no, most of us don't do that, do we? We have difficulty, yet we find in Genesis 6, here's what it says about Noah. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. You see, Noah was obedient to the things of the Lord. Whatever God told him to do, he did. And uh, it's amazing that even in the midst of the culture he was in, and we know from, again, looking back at the beginning of last week, that there was a demonized culture that angelic beings had uh, intermarried with, with human women. Um, and it says they were men of renown, and that there were giants or Nephilim on, Nephilim on the earth in those days. So we looked at that last week. And so now these people, this race of people, along with all of the other people who are now corrupted because of sin, watching Noah for a hundred years build this ark, most certainly went by where the old man was building his boat out in the middle of somewhere where there was no water, and uh, no doubt heckled him and made fun of him and certainly made jokes of him. And so now we find in verse 1, then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Even in the midst of this, this likely persecution, the hundred years task that God had given him to do that he did faithfully, that Noah did this in a blameless way. He did it in a righteous way before God. And now God begins to tell him, take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. So in verse 2, God commands Noah to take with you these seven pairs, um, and this would be for Noah's offerings or sacrifices at the end of the time of the flood when he could leave the ark, and we'll look at that next week <clears throat> in the section that we consider. And he was to use the, the clean animals as a, a sacrificial offering before the Lord as an act of worship. Now, keep in mind, the law has not yet been given, right? That, that doesn't come till much later through Moses. So God clearly had communicated to his people something of his law <clears throat> that they would understand and that they would carry out. Uh, even by the way that he told Noah to take uh, some of the clean and the unclean animals on board the ark with him. And then he says in verse 4, In seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. For every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. One of the most tragic verses in scripture in verse 4. I will blot out from the face of the ground every living thing I have made. God had so reached a point that not only would his spirit no longer strive with man, but even the creation itself had been affected by the corruption of sin. And again we find the word here in verse 5, and Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Now, when the scriptures repeat these things for us, it's not just to elevate Noah in our eyes or any person of God when the scriptures say these things. These things are here to encourage us in our walk before God and our obedience before the Lord. 
not just in the sense of God wants us to keep his word, but he's looking for the heart behind it, isn't he? We know that Jesus said in the New Testament, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, if we are loving God in that way, in that complete, in that full way, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, then when God gives us a command, either within our own hearts or certainly uh, from his word, which he's already done so clearly, we won't have a problem with it at that point. You see, as God gave Noah these commands and these instructions, Noah didn't have the right to challenge God on his instructions. Uh, Noah didn't go back to God with some edits to the plan. You know, Lord, I know you want this to be 450 feet long and 75 feet wide and 45 feet or so tall, but I don't like the proportions. Maybe we could add another deck. Maybe we could uh, make it a little bigger or change this dimension. You know, Noah didn't do that. He just did what God told him to do. And as Noah built this ark, which was probably more akin to just a large barge almost in the way that it's shaped, um, he did it joyfully. He did it with obedience in his heart. So now we begin to see what it means to be righteous. The righteous person rests everything on the bare word of God and obeys it. We also glimpse what it means to walk with God because to walk with him is not a stroll. It means to go uh, the same way in obedience, even as the culture marches in the other direction. What is the person God saves like? He believes in God's promise to him or to her, and it is counted as righteousness. And as, righteous, as a righteous person, he or she lives not a perfect but a blameless life. He walks with God, and everything about him is covered by obedience to God's perfect word. I love what he says here, this commentator, about not being perfect but being blameless. You see, in Christ, we of course have the Holy Spirit. And the attitude of our hearts is what God is looking at. Remember King David, as God looked at him, he said about him on a number of occasions that he was a man after God's own heart. And we know King David sinned in, in such a, a terrible way. But God looked past the sin because David repented. He looked to the heart and he saw what David was like and he called him as well a blameless man. So God's not looking for perfection, folks. He's looking for the heart that's perfect toward him in the sense of, is your heart for God? Do you love the Lord? So Noah, verse 6, was 600 years old when the floodwaters came upon the earth. So you see, there was no safe place on the earth except inside the ark. And in like manner, this speaks to us of the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ, does it not? There is no other way to get to heaven. There is no other way to meet God but through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 7, Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. You see, the flood, as we've already stated, is God's judgment. It's God pouring out his wrath upon a sinful and God-rejecting world. And they are escaping the waters of the flood, escaping the wrath of God by entering into the ark, which is the vehicle of salvation that God had prepared for them. So of the clean animals and of the animals that are not clean, of the birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God had commanded Noah. Let me remind you again, as we learned last week, that God brought the animals to Noah. He didn't send them all throughout the countryside and around the world to gather all the animals from all of the exotic locations. God brought all of the animals to Noah. And let me remind you as we, again, as we said last week, that God's calling is God's enabling. So, so God took what would, what would have been an impossible task and he brought those animals to Noah. Now on the day when they are entering the ark, 
The door is open, that, that huge ramp, which we can only picture sort of had a hinge at the bottom, and it lowered like a ramp, and then the animals just walked right on. And it's just amazing to have this picture in your mind of what God was doing in this situation. So the animals began to enter in, and after seven days, verse 10, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Now I want to stop right here and draw your attention to a passage of scripture in Isaiah 55. I'll read it to you beginning in verse 6 that I think helps bring some light to what's happening here. Here's what it says. Now keep in mind that all of the people who were about to get wiped out by the flood had a hundred years of the preaching of righteousness by the man Noah and no doubt Noah as he preached the righteousness of God was certainly preaching the grace of God. Yes, there was a time of judgment coming, but a hundred years was given that people might turn to the Lord. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And he, the Lord, will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Isaiah 55, 8, a verse every Christian ought to have underlined in their Bible. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Doesn't that illuminate what's happening here? You know, God told Noah to do this seemingly crazy thing. But God has a purpose and God has a plan. As it continues, Isaiah 55, 10, listen. For as the rain comes, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, so do not re and they so do not return, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Remember, we talked briefly about the parable of the sower, and actually that was one of the things in our daily devotional that came up within the past a week or so. The command of the Lord in the parable of the sower was just to be faithful to sow the seed. Share the word of God with people. Share it liberally. Share it with anybody and with everybody. And God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. What do we do in the face of a preacher of righteousness, Noah, who no doubt preached for a hundred years, but had not a single convert other than his family? What do we do with the prophets as they preach the word of God, yet comparatively few people repented and turned to follow the Lord. What do we do with the prophet Jeremiah who prophesied for 60 years and had no converts to show for it? What do we do with these things when God says, my word will go out of my mouth and it shall not return to me void? And I, I say to you this, it is God's place to take the word and apply it to the, the people's lives. You see, uh, just as you and I, we can't convert anyone, right? I, I'm, I'm guessing we all have someone or some people in our lives whom we know who do not know the Lord, whom we're praying for. But, you know, we can't make them believe, can we? All we can do is give them the word of God, tell them the truth, and most importantly, model the truth so that they can't point the finger at us and say, you hypocrite. Although sadly they can often. But live the truth, speak the truth, preach the truth to them. And God himself will cause the increase. God will cause the seed to fall on the fertile soil. So these people for a hundred years, of course, had not turned to the Lord. And it's an incredibly sad thing, just as it is in our day, where comparatively speaking, so few are turning to Christ in these days. Yet, 
Uh, we're going to read in just a moment this passage from Matthew that speaks to the days that we live in, just as in the days of Noah. So in verse 10, after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and of the windows of the heavens were opened. So the rains began to come. And it says here, notice, uh, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth. There are many who believe, and I'll read this to you in a moment, that it wasn't just the rain that came down from heaven. I mean, think about it raining for 40 days. Would that be enough to flood the entire earth and go over 22 feet above the highest peak on the earth? It says here that all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth. Many believe that God seismically shook the earth and caused waters to rise up and perhaps even leveled some, some places just to cause the waters of the oceans to come and to spread out over the earth as God brought the rains down. You see, God was serious about this situation. And so as this happened, as the windows of the heavens were opened and, and as the, the fountains of the great deep burst forth, it says here, this is what the person says about it, water surged up from underground and poured violently down from the heavens. This was undoubtedly accompanied by earthquakes as the subterranean waters broke through the surface of the earth. This is a picture of a worldwide catastrophe, not restricted to one local geographical area, meaning that it was global. And the rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, we're told again. On the very same day, verse 13, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. Here's what Matthew says, Jesus speaking here, Matthew 24, 36. In this section of Matthew, by the way, previously he had been talking about the time of the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. And I believe in this section that I'm about to quote to you from, Matthew 24, verse 36 and following, I believe he's speaking of the rapture of the church there, but let me read it to you. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, without going into a long reason why I believe that's referring to the rapture and not the tribulation, is because in the time of the tribulation, uh, when the second coming of Christ is coming, and we know this from, from having just studied this last fall, it's not going to be a happy, joyful time during that time, the time leading up to when Jesus returns. In fact, as we, as we looked at it there in chapters 6 through 19, the pouring out of God's wrath, the trumpets, the bowls, the seals, all of the judgments of God coming, it's not going to be a time where people are out having parties and you know, getting married and throwing big weddings and that kind of a thing. I believe this is the time that's leading up to when Jesus comes to take his church and then the time of the tribulation kicks off after the church is taken out of the way. And what he's saying here in this passage, regardless of which way you look at it, is that people are going to be surprised. And as the days of, the, of Noah were, people were, are going to just be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and just going about their business, doing whatever they want. And it says here, and here's the tragedy of what we're reading here in Genesis 7. And they did not know until the flood came. And so... The message today and what we're talking about here as we go through this very difficult and challenging subject of the flood is that God is always gracious. His grace and his mercy always precedes judgment. God gives people ample opportunity. 
God is always bringing warnings and bringing a message of hope and bringing a message of grace and bringing a message of peace, offering people an opportunity to turn to him, to repent, to call upon him in a time when he may be found. Yet, we're told by Jesus that tragically they didn't know until it was too late. And in verse 16 of Genesis 7, and those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. You see, the animals went in according to the command that God gave Noah. Uh, wow, if uh, pet obedience training could only be so good, huh? And the Lord shut him in. So once everyone was in the ark, there was no crew outside who could shut the door and secure it. Who closed the door? The Lord, the Lord himself closed the door. The Lord told Noah what to do. He told him how to do it. He gave him the means to do it. He brought the animals to him. Noah was obedient. He did the things that God had told him. And when God said, go into the ark, they went in. And when they went in, as it were, the divine hand of God closed that door and secured it. What a picture of salvation. That when we enter in, in the way that God has called, and in the, in the way that he has specified, coming to faith in Christ, humbling ourselves before God, calling upon the name of the Lord, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinful man or woman, repenting, turning, saying, God, please, God will shut you in, meaning welcome you into the boat of his salvation. So this suggests that the door to the ark had been standing open all of this time. Anyone could have entered. A literal open door to any who would go in. However, when the time was completely fulfilled, God at last shut that door on the day and the hour that he had predetermined, and it would never again open to those on the outside. Now is the day of salvation. Today, while it is called today, let us turn to the Lord. You see, today will not last forever. Psalm 31, I think, brings again clarity to this situation, perhaps from the point of view of how Noah may have been feeling. Psalm 31, these uh, verses are actually messianic, speaking of Jesus, but here's what it says. Psalm 31, 13, for I hear the slander of many, fear is on every side, while they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God, my times are in your hand, deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me, make your face shine upon your servant, save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed and let them be silent in the grave. The flood continued 40 days and 40 nights on the earth. Verse 17, the waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the face of the waters. So the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. When you start to think about the highest mountain peaks on the face of the planet covered by water so that there is not even one speck of dirt left exposed, this is an amazing and a mighty thing that God has done. Verse 20, the waters prevailed above the mountains covering them 15 cubits deep. According to the measure of a cubit, as we understand it, that would be about 22 and a half feet. So God didn't just flood the earth. He flooded up to the highest point and then went beyond. What an amazing thing. The language here is evocative of a violet, churning, whirling maelstrom. The repetitions in these verses, waters five times, increased two times, rose three times, greatly three times in the Hebrew, uh, portray a wild water everywhere. And the earth description in verse 11, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, 
and the windows of the heavens were opened describe a great rending of the beds of the seas and torrential rain that makes us recall chapter 1 when the waters above and below the firmament were separated into two entities. Now in a massive act of decreation, they were unleashed back into chaos. And I love that perspective because what God is doing is really in a sense undoing everything he had done from creation up until the day that Noah and his family entered the ark. And so here it is. They've entered the ark. The rains have come. God's judgment has fallen. And in verse 21, all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. The scriptures are going to great length to let us know that God's judgment was complete. In verse 23, he, God, blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. No doubt there were people who felt they had no warning, perhaps even shook angry fists at heaven. But the judgment was not a divine whim. Peter reveals that God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Noah had been warning mankind for a hundred years. Today, through the cross, Jesus has provided an ark of salvation from the coming judgment. He has warned explicitly of the coming judgment, and so have his apostles and prophets. Only those who enter the ark through his redeeming blood will be saved. This has been the message in these last days for more than 2,000 years years. God gave mankind a hundred year opportunity with Noah, but for us today, where we sit in human history, it has been 2,000 years of God's grace in making known to people God's way of salvation. Peter wrote, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure, pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men." Peter right there in that section of scripture, verses 1 through 7, 2 Peter uh, 3, 1 through 7, gives us a history of what's happened. He takes us from creation to the day, the, the next day of judgment that's coming. And while it's still called today, there are opportunities being given to people. One commentator said this, there are only three groups of people in this scenario, those that perished in the flood, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood, meaning Enoch. And it says here, and I'm just going to mention this because I love the way he said it, notice that Enoch was not post-flood or mid-flood, he was pre-flood. So Enoch was taken out before the wrath of God came upon the earth. And the waters prevail, Genesis 7, 24, on the earth, 150 days. Now, most of us are familiar with the, the 40 days and 40 nights, but you see there's more here um, around how many days were they actually in the ark, and I have a little graphic to show you in just a moment. But let me talk for a moment about the flood accounts from other cultures. You see, it's not just recorded here in the scriptures for us as if uh, that's not enough, and it is. 
Uh, but uh, one person who's done some research, uh, and I read this in several, but he wrote it, I think, the most succinctly. Uh, he cites the legends of the Samo Kubo tribe of New Guinea, the Athapascan Indians of America, the Papagago Indians of Arizona, the Brazilian tribes, the Peruvian Indians, the African Hottentots, the natives of Greenland, the native Hawaiian Islanders, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Persians, the Australian natives, the Welsh, the Celts, the Druids, the Siberians, and the Lith Lithuanians, the Babylonians, the Polynesians, and the Mexicans. More than 200 cultures have their own account of the flood, and the following aspects of their stories are in common. 88% of them describe a favored family. 70% of them attribute survival to some kind of a boat. 95% say the sole cause of the catastrophe was a flood. 66% say that the disaster is due to man's wickedness. 67% record that animals are also saved. 57% describe that the survivors end up on a mountain. And many of the accounts also specifically mention birds being sent out, a rainbow, and eight persons being saved. And that's just one little snippet of how other cultures have recorded in their history the account of the flood with a great deal of accuracy. So in chapter 8, verse 1, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. So the end is coming, but it's just starting and I love this verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, because Psalm uh, 29 dovetails with this verse so well. It says this, Psalm 29, verse 3, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And then down in verse 10, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. You see, even the psalmist looks back on it and said, the Lord sat enthroned at the flood. Now, I love that because it tells us that the flood was not chaotic. It wasn't random. God was in control the whole time. And I want to remind you this morning that no matter where you are and no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what kind of crisis or difficulty you are facing, these words apply to you, and I'll read them again. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits enthroned in your life, no matter what you're dealing with. Chapter 8, verse 2, The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And we know that the mountains of Ararat are in the regions of uh, the Caucasus, the tallest peaks in modern-day Turkey. And we also see something really interesting here that is not apparent to the naked eye by the dates that are being given. Sometimes we read these things and we're like, okay, it's great that he gave us a date, the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. However, Moses, when God had given him the law in, in Exodus chapter 12, God changed what we know as the civil calendar to a religious calendar. And the seventh month on the civil calendar became the first month on the religious calendar. So the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, was there anything special about that? The... Uh, seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the civil calendar, and then the first month on the religious calendar was the month of Nisan. That ought to ring a bell because that's the month of the Passover. On Nisan the 10th, the Passover lamb is selected. On Nisan the 14th, the Passover happens, the lamb is crucified, or in this case sacrificed. And on Nisan the 17th, which is three days after the Passover, there's the resurrection. 
So the ark of God came to rest on the top of Mount Ararat on the 17th of Nisan, the third day, the day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That ought to send shivers up your spine. What God has done. The pictures he has given us. The type of salvation. The ark clearly is a type of salvation. And again, in everything that we've been saying, the grace of God for a hundred years, the door being open for anyone to come in, uh, people could have turned to the Lord at any time, but they chose not to. And in like manner, 2,000 years since the resurrection of Christ, that same door of salvation is open to all mankind. The grace of God is abounding. The mercy of God is amazing. And the waters, Genesis 8 Verse 5, continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. The raven was an unclean bird. And that sort of gave him sort of an early warning sign. And then he sent forth, verse 8, uh, a, a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. The dove, of course, was a clean bird. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, uh, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a fl freshly plucked olive leaf. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. So I just want to show you a couple of things here to kind of put this in perspective for us. Uh, this one person put together a chart, and <clears throat> it's written this way just to show us so how, how God had sort of mirrored these uh, days sort of coming into the flood and coming out. Seven days of waiting for the flood, another seven days mentioned again in uh, 710, 40 days of the flood, 40 days and 40 nights of the rain, 40 days of the water rising or triumphing, another 450 days of the water waning, 40 days of waiting, seven days of waiting, seven days of waiting. And what all that points to is if you take all of that and you add it up, from the time Noah and his family and the animals entered the ark until the time that God opened the door for them to come out was 377 days or a year and 17 days. So it's pretty amazing. You know, we tend to think of this story as 40 days and 40 nights, but it was over a year that Noah and his family were on this ark. And so God sustained them. God gave them enough food, you know, and, and of course, God had directed Noah to take the food with him on the ark, and he did, but God made it last for the animals as well as for his family all during that time. So it is amazing the provision of God and how God can take things and stretch them and multiply them, perhaps even in times of leanness. And in verse 13, in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, verse 15, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. So God now in this moment is repatriating the earth. And this is, in a sense, like a second creation. Now, in the beginning, God, of course, spoke and created out of nothingness. Here, God had preserved the animals and the people through the flood. 
And his command to them looks very familiar as it did in the beginning in Genesis 1 when God said, be fruitful and multiply. Here again, he's telling them the same thing in verse 17. Be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And so as we come next week, picking it up in verse 20, we will find Noah as his first act of exiting the ark, sets up an altar and begins to worship the Lord. So we'll pick it up there next week. We'll finish uh, that small section of chapter 8, all of chapter 9. We're going to look at the marvelous covenant that God has given to us, to humanity through the rainbow. We'll talk about that. It's just a, it's an amazing Bible study. I'm looking forward to it. And then we'll finish off with this statement from Hebrews 11, looking back at Noah's life. And here's what it says. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Why does the word of God tell us this? Because God wants us to have this kind of faith. The kind of faith where it's said of Noah and hopefully can be said of us that he obeyed the Lord, that he obeyed the Lord completely. He didn't question God. The Lord God was in the center of his sights. God was his purpose. God was his life. God was his focus. And Noah was divinely warned just as we have been warned have we not, of the times that are coming? We've been given a mandate. We've been given the great commandment and the great commission. We've been given the things that God wants us to focus on. And so that's what we are to do. And we are to move with godly fear just as Mo uh, Moses, excuse me, Noah moved with godly fear. He acted in faith. He prepared the ark for the saving of his household and he became the heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Don't underestimate the power of faith in the word of God and the promises of God. And don't underestimate the power of a simple act of obedience in your life and in my life. You see, through faith and through obedience, God gives us grace. God blesses us through, through obedience and through faith. Noah took seriously the things of God. And I hope that uh, of the many things that I hope we're learning as we go through this study of Genesis, and in particular, these four chapters on the life of Noah, is that God wants us to take him and the things of God seriously. Now, while it's called today, let us walk in grace and walk in obedience to the Lord. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Lord, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for your kindness to us. Lord, for those listening today who perhaps have never trusted in Christ, we just tell them right now and offer an opportunity to just right now turn their hearts to you, Lord, and to, to come to you and just say, Lord, I need you. I, I need your forgiveness. <clears throat> I want you to come into my life, Lord, and wash me clean and just, Lord, I want this eternal life. I, I want this life where, like Noah, I can walk with you. And so, Lord, we know that you'll do that. And, Lord, we also know that we don't have to get cleaned up before we come. That when we come to you, you clean us up. You wash us. And so, Lord, for those of us who have already done that, who have already prayed and asked you to come into our lives and turned our hearts toward you, we thank you for that, and we pray, Lord, for a fervency in our lives, that we might be filled with faith toward you, that we might take the things of God seriously, and that like Noah, we would have faith and live according to faith. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.